It was the beginning of August, close to the time where the Persades would cross the sky. Where is it Persides? Well, it doesn't really matter. It's a huge meteor shower. My wife and I had just put the kids to bed and we were enjoying an evening out. We lived in a small town called Harleton in Montana. It was a nice place to live. Population of below a thousand where young adults barely existed because, well, once they were of age, they all left for bigger towns. And outside of the cereal factory workers, their wives and young children, this place was a ghost town. Not that it was a bad thing. Hell, I loved it very much. Tranquility of it all, the low crime rate, the ability to crack a cold one and safely sit on my back porch with my wife while the kids were asleep was just fantastic. I wouldn't have left it, even if they paid me. But they didn't have to. I remember the sky that night. We were waiting for that famous rain of falling stars. Now, my wife and I, we were not big fans of the whole science-y stuff, but she'd seen the broadcast about them and wanted us to watch. I indulged, because I would have spent some time outside anyway. It was about 85 degrees outside, just gorgeous, and still pretty hot. And that's when we saw it. The sky was illuminated with a purplish light unlike anything we'd ever seen. We heard a muted crash sound coming from the west, close to where the factory was. And shortly thereafter, the falling stars appeared. Now, part of me wanted to get in my truck and go see what that crash was, but my wife rolled her eyes and said that it was a meteorite. It wouldn't be bigger than a rock. She said she read somewhere that our atmosphere destroyed most meteorites when they came through, and mostly ended up the size of rocks by the time they reached the ground. Again, I would have gone, but the smile she gave me and the falling stars in the background painted a much more attractive idea than getting my jeans back on and looking for a hot rock in the dark. We stayed and watched the thing, and that was that. Now, I used to work at that factory. Did I mention that? I don't think I did. Anyway, the very next day, I go by for work, and there's a bunch of government workers dressed like they're going to Chernobyl surrounding the factory. They say the factory's closed because there's a gas leak, but let me tell you, I had never seen gas workers wearing such strange outfits. Now, the workers and I complained a bit about having no warning, no paid leave, and, well, basically no information at all. We stayed there for a while before we were gently removed from the premises because it was dangerous, or so they said. Anyway, came back home to the wife and told her that the hot rock probably perforated a gas line and now the factory was closed for God knows how long because of the leak. And I was off for a grand total of two weeks. Now, it's a pretty long time to fix a gas leak if you ask for my opinion. Now, I'm pretty sure my boss was ready to eat his fingers when they finally gave him the go to reopen. And two weeks behind on schedule was definitely not good for business. So we worked double shifts for the following two weeks to try and get on schedule again. The bonus pay was nice, but with the kids starting school and all, it meant I hadn't been able to spend much time at home. I left early in the morning and I came back late in the afternoon, drained and stinking like cereal and sweat. It took another week for things to calm down at work enough for me to get back to my regular schedule, and... As a way to thank us, we could take back however many boxes of cereals we wanted. Don't worry, we also had a generous bonus for our double shifts, so the cereal is just a nice personal touch, so to speak. I don't eat them, personally. You see, working with them all day makes me not want to see them. Plus, I'm lactose intolerant. But I know the wife would have killed me on the spot if I didn't bring back at least four or five boxes of the stuff. 
Free food is free food, ain't it? It's always nice to get free food until you get sick. I couldn't have known it was the cereal, though. They said on the news there was a flu outbreak. Kids got it first, which is normal since public schools are a cesspool of germs and bacteria. So that shit is pretty easily shared between the kids and by lack of proper janitorial services. I mean, sure, they don't need to make the school squeaky clean and hospital worthy. But you know what? A mop and a cleaning of some door handles here and there wouldn't hurt a bit. Whatever, I'm getting off track here. The kids got pulled out of school, and they stayed home. Hell, they liked it. Well, at first, they weren't too sick. Just some bouts of fever, some belly cramps, and a reduced appetite. Nothing too alarming, and my wife was home to monitor them. I wasn't too worried, so I just kept going to work like normal. My wife was taking care of them, and uh, I couldn't afford days off, not with Christmas coming in a few months. And then my wife got sick. Very sick. The kids were battling their occasional bouts of fever, but my wife found it hard to get out of bed. She said that she could do it and that I couldn't stop working. But I didn't feel right doing that. But I went into work anyway, and I found out that some of my co-workers were experiencing the same thing. And worst of all, a lot of my co-workers were absent. The company was dealing, but I was offered to take on more shifts since I was healthy, and a lot of workers were away due to that flu outbreak. Two weeks later, I had to take a break. I'd been doing some crazy hours at work, and my wife was getting worse and worse. I brought her to the hospital, paid for all the screenings and blood samples, but you know what? Well, they couldn't find a goddamn thing. She complained about pains in her stomach, and when they x-rayed it, they found something that looked like a mass. We feared the worst, you know? Cancer? They said there were more tests to be done and that they couldn't be sure before that. They gave us an appointment set two weeks later and told us to keep away from spicy foods or anything that could irritate the stomach. Well, the kids were also starting to feel quite under the weather, but not yet enough to warrant a trip to the doctor. And I still ended up with a bill in the thousands just because of those screenings. It was a small price to pay to keep my wife safe though. We were devastated by the news, but we tried to stay hopeful. Maybe, just maybe, it was an ulcer, or maybe their radio was defunct and she had nothing. She said the cramps weren't too bad and, well, that she could still take care of the kids. And with bills like that, well, I had no other choice but to pick up work again. When I got back to work, I realized that more than half the workers were absent. My boss looked utterly nervous, kept looking at us sideways and asking us to do more. Now with the medical bills, most of us did take on a few more hours, but it still wasn't enough for the business. We were behind on schedule, two weeks again because of that damn flu outbreak. But it wasn't the flu. And we discovered it about another week later. I came back from work and my wife was cleaning up a mess in the kitchen. She was pale as a ghost, dark circles giving her the sickly look you never want a family member to have. She told me the kids had been sick, she had to give them anti-vomiting meds, and that if they didn't feel better the next morning, well, we'd probably have to bring them to the hospital. In the house at this point, well, it smelled like a mix of bile and pine soul. So, I cracked the window, just, just a little bit. Everyone was sick enough already, and I was wondering how I hadn't gotten sick yet. Everyone in the house was sick, and I was not the kind of person who washed his hands regularly. Plus, I still kissed my wife. Not on the lips, mind you, but the cheeks, forehead, you know. And yet, 
I was in top shape while everyone around me looked like they were dying. Hell, I was trying to stay optimistic. They said it was the flu. How long can this virus last? About three weeks. I mean, everybody should have been getting better soon, right? But with the vomiting beginning, well, it didn't seem likely. You see, I ran a bath for my wife and went to the kids' room. I kissed her forehead and the elder cracked an eye open. His forehead was burning and his breathing was raspy. I went to the bathroom and prepared a cold towel for him, which I delicately applied to his forehead, and I heard him whisper, Thanks, Dad, before falling right back asleep. There was only soup for dinner that night, but I knew my wife would go to bed early, so I could always fetch some wings at the local bar if I had a craving later. I put her to bed around 9 o'clock and went to the bar. It was empty, aside from the two leeches that were always stuck to the counter like they lived there. I ordered myself some hot wings and beer and watched soccer on the cheap screen before going back home. As soon as I entered, I knew. I knew something wasn't right. You see, the smell of pine soul was barely covering the smell of acid and iron. I heard a plaint coming from my bedroom and the telltale sound of liquid hitting the bottom of a bucket. It was my wife's turn to be sick. I entered the room and there she was, sitting on the edge of the bed, bent over a bucket. She tied up her hair in a loose bun and her skin looked moist, even from a distance. I could see the reflection of a lump on her back skin, which was glistening with sweat. I approached her carefully as she vomited again and asked her if she wanted some water, some anti-vomiting, a cold towel, just anything. Her head turned toward me slowly, and I realized in horror that she was vomiting blood. Her perfect smile was stained crimson, her chin covered in rivulets of blood. Her beautiful brown eyes looked beige as if she had been blinded. The beads of sweat on her forehead so big it looked like she had just gotten out of the shower. I yelled to her, I'm taking you to the hospital right now. She didn't react. She spit some more blood in the bucket before standing up. Her nightdress was stuck to her skin, and I saw something move on her stomach. I don't feel too good. She whispered before dropping the bucket to the ground, blood now seeping into the pink carpet on her side of the bed, and she started convulsing on the spot. I rushed to call 911 instantly, asked for an ambulance said my wife was spitting a fountain of blood and convulsing. I didn't know what the hell to do. During her convulsions, she gripped the hem of her dress and lifted it. And an inhuman growl escaped her lips, and the demonic sound was followed by her screaming. It was like I was eviscerating her. I let go of the phone and grabbed her hands to plant them to the ground, because she was starting to scratch her stomach. There were already deep welts caused by her nails on her fair skin. And that's when I saw it. I saw something bulge under her skin. Bulge like they did in that one sci-fi movie. It moved beneath her skin, rippling like a wave as if searching for the perfect spot to pierce out. And my wife was howling and clawing at my forearms, leaving deep gashes into them. And I screamed, what the fuck is that? As a single claw gutted my wife from the inside out, and a horrid, parasite-looking bug clawed its way out of her. 
I let go of her arms in terror as she lost consciousness and convulsed again, the creature clawing its way out. It didn't even have a face, and it looked like an absolute monstrosity. A mix of scorpion and centipede, with eight legs that all ended in a single very sharp claw. Its skin looked like it was hard as a shell, and I stared in horror as it kept tearing at my wife's skin. Now it took me a few seconds of shock to rise from the ground and get a baseball bat from the closet. And I ran to it and as soon as I wrapped my hands around the bat, I heard the disgusting noise of blood in the back of my wife's throat as she drowned in it. The creature was almost out, and it's with tears in my eyes that I slammed down the bat on it. I heard my wife's ribs collapse, but the creature wasn't dead. It escaped her stomach and dropped on my carpet, leaving an awful bloody stain. I slammed the bat down on it again and heard the sound of its shell cracking. I slammed again, gray blood finally exposed to the air. The creature released a shrill noise that turned my blood to ice. And it died there. The kids. Well, hell, I ran towards the kids' room, but... It was too late. As soon as I entered, the sound of their dying screams echoed against my eardrums. I couldn't save them. I could only stomp the creatures as the police sirens and the sound of my own sobs worked in pair to cover the noise of my dying children. The sky was illuminated with a purplish light, and they said it was because of a meteorite moving too close to Earth. They also said it was a gas leak at the factory, but it wasn't. I think they never found out what crashed and what hit its eggs in our cereal, and it ruined us. But you see, my voice didn't matter. Not back then and certainly not now that I'm on death row. The story was buried, and in the media, they called me. A monster. <laughs>